Uh, and again, I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, with that, Kyle, I'll turn it over to you. His presentation is uh, Paradigm Shift, Striped Bass Management in the Tar Noose and Cape Fear Rivers. Uh, and Kyle Rachel is our, Rachel's is our District 4 Fisheries Biologist. Thank you, David. And before I really, there we go. Before I get into the, the meat of the presentation, I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, considerable efforts of all the commission staff who have either collected data or analyzed data, uh, produced fish, or uh, in some other ways furthered our knowledge over the last decade of striped bass uh, in the uh, Tar Noose and Cape Fear Rivers. Um, this research is um, really what I'm going to give is just kind of a, a broad level overview of, of what we've done over the last 10 years and, and further back. Um, but we've really produced a lot of information over the last decade, um, over 256 pages of just agency reports on, on these striped bass populations. And that doesn't include reports that we've um, uh, gotten from North Carolina State University on research we funded, uh, analyses we've partnered with the Division of Marine Fisheries on that are, will be part of the fisheries management plan um, and other uh, peer reviewed articles that have been published. So Jimmy McCargo gave a, a presentation in January of 2021 um, on the striped bass management in coastal North Carolina and really highlighted the Albemarle Roanoke River population in the northeastern part of the state as well as the fisheries management plan process, the process by which we collaborate with the Division of Marine Fisheries and the Marine Fisheries Commission on striped bass management in the coast. Um, pretty much everything else uh, outside of the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River is considered the Central Southern or CSMA uh, striped bass stock. And these include the spawning populations in the Tar Pamlico, Noose, and Cape Fear Rivers. For much of this presentation, for at least the first half of it, I'm really going to focus on the Noose River population. Um, the Tar Pamlico population is pretty similar to the Noose, um, but the Cape Fear has its own uh, uh, peculiarities that, that we'll cover towards the end of the, the presentation. Speaking of the Noose specifically, there's pretty good evidence that there was a fairly significant striped bass stock historically, although it was much reduced compared to the Roanoke River Albemarle Sound population. In the late 19th century, there were uh, U.S. Fisheries Commission reports that several thousand striped bass were caught commercially and, and sold uh, or exported to, to northern fish markets. And in 1907, the first Fishes of North Carolina monograph noted that um, behind the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River population, the Noose River had the most prolific striped bass fishery in North Carolina. Commercial landings through the earliest part of the 20th century gradually declined a bit um, before receiving a bump in the post-war years to almost 40,000 pounds of striped bass that were harvested in Craven County, which encompasses the Lower Noose River and is uh, where the, the most of the Newburn fish houses are, or all of the Newburn fish houses. Uh, moving on uh, past the fisheries is the habitat in the Noose River. Millburnie Dam was constructed northeast of Raleigh in 1902. Previously, there were wooden dams at that location throughout the 19th century before the concrete dam that was placed in 1902. And this dam was most recently removed just in 2017. However, there was very little striped bass spawning habitat, most likely above that location, just given the location of the falls at that site. Most striped bass spawns considered uh, historically to have been between Goldsboro and Raleigh. In 1952, a dam was constructed in Goldsboro, Quaker Neck Dam. That dam was removed in 1998, but before its removal, Quaker Neck Dam really restricted striped bass movement into almost all of its spawning grounds. Um, you know, as I mentioned, most of the spawning grounds are between Goldsboro and Raleigh, and there's not much spawning habitat that was below Quaker Neck Dam. So this really limited the, the spawning migrations of striped bass in the Noose River. The most recent dam that was constructed on the main stem Noose River was Falls Dam in 1981. And that is a 
flood control reservoir uh, operated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And that is currently the only dam that is still on the main stem, Noose River, and it's not going anywhere. So to give a bit of a timeline uh, further on, on Noose River striped bass, um, you'll remember that the Quaker Neck Dam, the lowest most dam on the Noose, was constructed in 1952. The Wildlife Resources Commission received reports in the 1960s from anglers that striped bass were on the decline. And some research efforts were initiated to try and understand that decline, but very few striped bass were caught and no real management uh, uh, useful advice was came out of those efforts. Not long after the striped bass along the entire Atlantic coast uh, fell on hard times. The stocks collapsed uh, in Chesapeake Bay, the Hudson River, the entire Atlantic coastal stock, uh, including Albemarle Sound, Roanoke River. And by the 1980s, management efforts were very intensive on those stocks to, to help them recover. Part of the management to help recover the Albemarle Sound, Roanoke River population involved stocking. Stocking in the Noose River and the other CSMA rivers uh, historically had been fry stocking, so stockings of larvae that were uh, several days up to a week or so after they had hatched. Um, but beginning in the 1980s, there were occasionally uh, kind of leftover or, or fish that weren't needed necessarily on the Albemarle Sound uh, Roanoke population, and those were occasionally stocked into the Noose Tar and, and Cape Fear Rivers. Uh, I mentioned here phase two stockings, um, whereas previous stockings of striped bass were largely fry, so those, those several week old or several day old fish. Um, phase two stockings are fish that are five to seven inches long that are stocked in December. Um, also in the 1970s and 80s, there were occasionally fish that were stocked as juveniles in the summer, and these are typically fish that were one to two inches in length. But the phase two fish, uh, the thinking behind them is that they were large enough to avoid some predation and, and contribute more to the populations. The 1990s really saw the, the Atlantic coastal striped bass stocks start to rebound, including the, the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River population, and stocking was discontinued in the Albemarle Sound and Roanoke River at that time. And, but we had built up a, a considerable amount of hatchery capacity to stock striped bass. So we began annual stocking of either those juvenile phase one or phase two fish in the 1990s in the Noose, Tar, and Cape Fear Rivers. Additionally, we started our Wildlife Resources Commission biological surveys at this time. Uh, beginning in 1994 in the Noose River, we started our electrofishing, boat electrofishing survey on the spawning grounds for striped bass. In 2004, the Division of Marine Fisheries compiled its first fisheries management plan for striped bass that would, had to conform to the Fisheries Reform Act 1997. And I won't um, get into that uh, uh, very much. You can go back and uh, review Jeremy McCargo's excellent presentation from January that discusses uh, the fisheries management plan process in much more detail as it relates to striped bass. But there were sections in the fisheries management plan that uh, were uh, to, to guide striped bass management in the CSMA, uh, Noose, Tar, Pam, and Cape Fear Rivers. But largely the data were found to be insufficient um, for managing those rivers. So much of the management actions were kind of borrowed from the Albemarle Sound and Roanoke River population. And in 2010, we began using parentage-based tagging to help understand the effects of our stockings, which had been pretty significant up to this point. Um, prior to 2010, we were using chemical methods to, to mark our hatchery product. And the problems with the chemical methods were that the fish did not always retain those tags, that, that mark. So it was very difficult to tell uh, later if a when we encountered a fish in the wild, if it was a hatchery fish or not. But using those methods, we had pretty much assessed that our stocking was really just supplementing natural production 
in the the CSMA rivers that we weren't having a, a very large impact um, from our stocking programs. But again, in 2010, we began that parentage based tagging uh, project. So I mentioned our biological surveys that on the Noose River began in 1994. And with those surveys, we are interested in relative abundance. So how many fish do we catch per hour of electric fishing on the spawning grounds? We're also collecting size data. How long are the fish? What is their weight? Uh, whether the fish is male or female? We also collect scale samples so that we can assess the age of the fish. And since 2010, we've been collecting fin clip samples, which is just a small tissue sample um, that we can send to our geneticists to determine if a fish that has been produced since 2010, um, if that fish came from the hatchery or not. So again, we began the parents to base tagging program in 2010 and with it, we can assess if any striped bass we encounter was born in 2010 in a fish hatchery in North Carolina or if it wasn't. So in 2011, the first year that we collected the field data from these fish after after stocking. From previous efforts and, and chemical marking, we're anticipating that we would see some natural reproduction. Uh, in the following graphs, if you see a color um, other than black, it indicates hatchery uh, a hatchery origin fish. So in 2011, we found a lot of pretty much all all of the fish were stocked from the hatchery that were in those um, recruitment year classes. We didn't observe any wild reproduction. Again, 2012 for the Noose River, um, we added another year class. Again, all hatchery fish in orange. So we have in 2012, the 2010 and 2011 year classes that were essentially all hatchery fish. You will notice a, a small black bar that says no genetic tag. No genetic tag means that it was not a hatchery stocked fish since 2010. It could have been a hatchery stocked fish in 2009 or in prior years, or it is a fish that was born naturally either in that river system or from immigration from some other river system. We really can't tell. But early on in the stocking program, we anticipated seeing fish with no genetic tag on the upper end of our size range. That one fish that was was had no genetic tag is on the upper end of the size range and is likely a fish from the 2009 year class. We just can't tell definitively um, you know, the origin of that fish. Moving on to our field surveys in 2013 in the Noose River, we again added actually two more year classes. The 2012 and 2013 year classes were observed and they were almost all hatchery fish. Um, we have more fish that were assessed as having no genetic tags, but again, these are all on the upper end of the size range and are likely fish that were born in 2009 or, or in previous years. And the 2014 year class, uh, year field sampling year, we we again observed the 2013 year class, and in in those size ranges of fish, they were all hatchery fish. So this really kind of flipped on on what we thought was was going on with our stocking program in the Noose River and in all the CSMA rivers, and that we thought that we were just supplementing natural reproduction. So we really branched out on our research and, and tried to understand what was going on. In 2016 and 2017, we conducted an egg and larval survey using what are called bongo nets, basically plankton nets, to target striped bass eggs on the spawning grounds and, and below the spawning grounds in the rivers. And in the Noose River in 2016, we collected 119 striped bass eggs. Uh, about 65% of them were viable, so they were in some uh, stage of development. And we caught about one egg in every 8 to 10 cubic meters of water that was, was sampled. We followed up again in 2017 and, and caught much fewer eggs, but a similar, uh, similar egg viability. And we also caught one larval striped bass. Uh, overall, the daily survival rate on the eggs was 48%. 
the percent viability and the daily survival rates that we encountered were pretty much on par with what is reported in the literature for striped bass in the Roanoke River and in Chesapeake Bay and Hudson Rivers. The biggest difference is really the egg density, the number of eggs per meter cubed. Um, so we're catching one egg every eight to 10 meters cubed at best in the Noose River. Whereas in even in, when the Albemarle San Roanoke River population was collapsed, there were thousands to tens of thousands of eggs per meter cubed. So we were several orders of magnitude lower in our egg production in the Noose River. So why was there such poor reproduction? We had four to five year classes of fish and they're almost 100% from the hatchery. Um, on the spawning grounds during our surveys, we observe spawning fish. Uh, we, we see uh, what are termed rock fights, fish actually reproducing. Um, we collect brood stock and send those brood fish to the hatchery and they produce fish for stocking just fine. But we're just not seeing very many eggs in the river system. You know, this is kind of what we started to, to get our heads around. This is an example of, well, this is Jeremy McCargo with a about a 60 pound striped bass from the Roanoke River. By no means is this a common fish on the Roanoke River today. Um, yeah, this is, is fairly uncommon, but the Roanoke River does have large female striped bass. And in, in when the stock is, is built on the Roanoke River, there are you know, a fairly decent number of 15 to 20 pound female striped bass that are producing eggs. This is the biggest striped bass I've ever actually touched in my life. This is about a 15 pound striped bass on the Noose River in 2014. And they produce much fewer eggs than those bigger uh, striped bass that, that we see elsewhere. This graph depicts that. Um, so at the top uh, on the Noose, Tar, and Cape Fear Rivers, an age three female striped bass is going to be somewhere around 22 inches long and it'll produce about a half million eggs. If that fish can live another three years, it's going to be around 27 inches long and produce about three times as many eggs. If it makes it to 10 years old, we're talking about a 35 inch fish that's producing over 2 million eggs. And if it can reach 20 years old, now we're talking about a pretty big fish, 45 inches or better, um, four and a half million eggs or more, you know, the type of fish that Jeremy McCargo was holding in the previous picture. This is an example of the age structure that we caught on the Noose River in 2014. On this graph, the horizontal axis depicts age, so ages three through ten, and catch is on the vertical axis. So in 2014, uh, close to the origin, we caught about 75 three-year-old striped bass. We caught it close to 110 four-year-old striped bass, and then back down to about 75 or 85-year-old striped bass, and so on. We started thinking, well, the lack of big fish in the river is really a product of mortality rates. If mortality rates are too high, you won't have old fish. And the oldest fish that we were seeing is, is 10 years old, whereas on the Roanoke River, we see fish uh, right on up to 20 years old, um, and striped bass elsewhere have been observed to over 31 years of age. Uh, on the Noose River, they're just only getting about a third as old as they have been observed elsewhere. By using this catch at age, figure, you can estimate the total mortality rate of your population uh, using a, a linear regression. And the slope of this red line would give you the total mortality rate, so the rate at which the adult fish are dying each year. At the same time that we started looking at this, we were funding a project for North Carolina State University, and they were able to estimate natural mortality rates of fish in the Noose River. Yeah, total mortality is just the, the sum of natural mortality, which is things like predation, and fishing mortality, which is just as it sounds, mortality due to either harvesting of fish or catch and release, uh, fishing mortality, discard mortality, and so on. So by knowing the total mortality rates from a catch curve like this, and the natural mortality rates from the North Carolina State University study, we could estimate fishing mortality rates 
And we did this for each year that we had data on the Neese River. This is what that looks like. It's a little bit busy, but I'll walk you through it. The horizontal axis is just time, the entire time series of data we had for the Neese River. The vertical axis is the fishing mortality rate. And the white line is the actual observed fishing mortality for each year. The red line is the target fishing mortality rate from the last fisheries management plan. That target mortality rate was adopted based on data from the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River population, but it was used as a proxy for the other CSMA stocks as well. Essentially, if the fishing mortality rate is above this red line, then the population would be considered to be experiencing overfishing, which is bad. And we see that in many years, the fishing mortality rate is above that line and would be considered to have be experiencing overfishing. Of course, recently the Roanoke River population is also overfished with overfishing occurring and currently the, the proposed target mortality rates are much lower than they were uh, under that red line and they're closer to this dashed blue line now. Uh, using that as a benchmark, then in all but one year, overfishing would be considered to be over free occurring. And the actual fishing mortality rates were pretty comparable to levels that were witnessed in the stock collapses of the 1970s. So we, we now knew that fishing mortality rates were pretty high, um, or we had a good, good feeling of that. We wanted to know why. Um, we had krill surveys that uh, assessed recreational fishing and recreational removals in the Noose River. There was also the uh, Division of Marine Fisheries tracks commercial landings through their trip ticket program. So we had estimates of removals um, from those uh, surveys. But there could also be other things that are maybe kind of influencing the results, like uh, it had been hypothesized before that maybe the natural mortality estimates were wrong. And uh, given all the fish kills and other problems in the Lower Noose River, that maybe dissolved oxygen or, or high summertime temperatures could be influencing the mortality rates. So we compiled a bunch of hypotheses and, and tested these using statistical models. And we had our analysis validated by an external statistical consultant at the time. One of the other things that we hypothesized was that the commercial fishing effort, so not just the, the landings that are reported, but the actual amount of uh, nets in the water, gill nets in the water in the commercial fishery could be influencing a, a high discard mortality rate and we acquired data to, to explore that also. This depicts the results of that analysis and essentially you just have to know that um, you know, the different models, the different variables that we investigated are on the left hand side. Gill net effort is the number of gill net trips taken each year in the Noose River. Harvest was the reported commercial harvest of striped bass from those gill net trips. DO is the summertime dissolved oxygen, and temp is the summertime water temperature. But these models are ranked from best model at the top to worst model at the bottom that were supported by the data. And we see that the top uh, six models all had gill net effort. So we, we determined that gill net effort and, and not um, commercial harvest was the, the principal factor driving the, the mortality rates uh, in the Noose River. One of the biggest weaknesses of this analysis was that we didn't have a full time series of, of recreational fishing. Our recreational uh, creel survey did not encompass the full range of the years that we had data for, but we knew that the actual amount of recreational harvest was pretty similar to commercial harvest. Um, they're both several thousand pounds per year, so recreational harvest probably would perform about the same as commercial harvest in this modeling exercise. But again, we found that the, the amount of gill nets in the water, not reported commercial harvest of striped bass, was the, the biggest influencer of striped bass mortality in the Noose River. And this is what those data look like. This is in gill net effort and mortality rates in the noose. Um, this is the difference rates of those of those variables. So essentially the change from one year to the next. 
And really what we see to, to, to explain it is that as gillnet trips increase or decline from one year to the next, the mortality rate of striped bass on the spawning grounds the following spring is pretty much in lockstep with that change in the amount of gillnet trips. And this is the, was the most significant impactor of mortality in the Noose River uh, over the time series. So moving on to, to more recent management actions, um, in 2018, we, the Wildlife Resources Commission, uh, changed our rules to try to protect the fish a little bit longer and see if we could advance the age structure, try and get older females on the spawning grounds, even though uh, acknowledging that most of the mortality in the stock was really outside of our jurisdiction. So we proposed and passed a 26 inch minimum length limit in inland waters of the Tar and Noose rivers. This uh, management, th this rule never fully went into effect before in 2019. Uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries suspended all harvest in their waters in the central southern management area. And we uh, correspondingly closed by proclamation the season in inland waters. The Division of Marine Fisheries also suspended all gillnet use upstream of the Cherry Branch Minnesota Beach Ferry in the Noose River and upstream of the Bayview and Aurora Ferry in the Pamlico River. And upstream of these areas was really where most of the striped bass population, the adult striped bass, uh, uh, spend most of their time when they're not spawning. This is some of the most recent data that we have on parentage-based tagging for the Noose River. So we, we left off with 2014 earlier, and now we're to 2019 data, and we're still awaiting some some result. We, we have some results for 2020, but they were, were fairly minimal. We'll have uh, results for 2021 probably next year. But again, we see that you know over 92% of the striped bass in the Noose River are hatchery origin. We do have some fish now that are you know have no genetic tag and are in sizes that suggest that they were produced in the wild. But what we don't know is whether or not those fish were produced in the Noose River or from an adjacent river system like the Tar River or the Roanoke River. Uh, similarly, here's the 2019 Tar River stocking contribution from parentage-based tagging. And we do see that there's a, a, a lot more fish in the Tar River that do not have a genetic tag, at least in the 2019 field survey. And, but again, we don't know if this is the result of natural reproduction in the Tar River uh, or if it is some spillover from the Roanoke River population. We know that when the Roanoke River produces large year classes, those year classes are more prone to move outside of the Albemarle Sound area and into adjacent river systems. So that remains a, a management question that we have. So over the last decade, we, we've really seen a paradigm shift in in striped bass management in the CSMA rivers, the Tar, the Noose, and the Cape Fear. And the, the biggest relates to hatchery contribution, the influence that we have on these populations. You know, 10 years ago, we thought that our stocking program was really just supplementing the natural reproduction, that we weren't sustaining the population like we now know that we are. We have high stocking contribution in these systems. Also, uh, over a decade ago, we were thinking that, you know, natural mortality might be the driving impact uh, of, of maybe having older fish um, through the, the numerous fish kills that have occurred in the Lower Noose River and in the Pamico River on occasion. And really, after uh, our modeling uh, and, and research efforts and, and efforts that we helped fund at North Carolina State University, we've determined that fishing mortality is the driving factor um, preventing older fish uh, in these populations. And the regulations uh, up until the um, until 2018 were really borrowed from the Roanoke River uh, management area and the data that, that went into to formulating them there. You know, we used to have an 18 inch minimum length limit with a 22 inch to 27 inch protected slot. Uh, before we changed that using data from the Noose River to try and protect those fish and, and get them a little bit older by implementing a 26 inch minimum length limit. 
which is uh, currently the rule that is on the books, although, again, the season is closed in the Tar uh, and the Noose Rivers. I'm going to change up for the last few minutes and talk about the Cape Fear River because it is, um, you know, the, the factors affecting it are much different than the Tar and the Noose at, at the current moment. This is a picture of Lock and Dam 3, or William O. Husk Lock and Dam, in northern Bladen County near Fayetteville. And this is an aerial view of the same, the same structure. Uh, most folks uh, you know, are, are familiar with what a low head dam would look like, just as in the previous picture. But there's also a series of lock structures associated with, with the dams on the Cape Fear. The lock structure is just this uh, passageway on the left-hand side that allows boats to move upstream and downstream around the dam. There's three locks and dams on the Cape Fear River, all within Bladen County, beginning with Lock and Dam 1, uh, about 40 miles upstream of Wilmington, Lock and Dam 2 near Elizabethtown, North Carolina, and the, the previously pictured William O. Husk Lock and Dam, or Lock and Dam 3, in northern Bladen County. There's also the, the first dam that was constructed in the Cape Fear River is Buckhorn Dam between Sanford and Apex. Um, but Pretty much all of the spawning habitat, or most of the spawning habitat for striped bass are below Buckhorn Dam. Unfortunately, they're above all three of the locks and dams um, in the Cape Fear River. And historically, we have uh, partnered with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who, who operates the, the locks and dams, to provide for some fish passage to try and get anadromous fish to the spawning grounds at Smiley's Falls, depicted by that yellow star. A bit of a timeline, those locks and dams were constructed between 1915 and 1935, and they are operated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They were uh, congressionally uh, uh, authorized to provide for deep draft commercial navigation of the river to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, after their construction, um, you know, striped bass were large striped bass in any event were, were kind of last reported in the 1970s. There were some that were collected by Wildlife Resources Commission staff at that time in our surveys, um, but that was also about the last time that anglers uh, in the Wilmington area uh, caught any of the, the big adult striped bass. By the 1990s, commercial traffic of the Cape Fear had pretty much ceased. Um, at that time, surveys in the Cape Fear River uh, showed that Pretty much all the striped bass in the Cape Fear River were, were gone. Um, the striped bass that were present were actually hybrid striped bass that were stocked in Jordan Reservoir at the time. I would mentioned uh, earlier in relation to the Noose and, and Tar Rivers that um, as the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River population uh, rebounded, more hatchery fish became available for stocking in, in other river systems and we really began annual stocking of striped bass in the Cape Fear River at that time and began to focus on attempting to rebuild the striped bass population. Uh, as we really increased stocking of, of striped bass in the, in the 1990s, uh, we also, with the Division of Marine Fisheries, implemented a harvest moratorium in 2008. So since 2008, there's been no allowed harvest, recreational or commercial, of any striped bass in the Cape Fear River system. And then finally, in 2013, a Rock Arch Rapids fishway was constructed at the first dam, Lock and Dam 1, on the Cape Fear River to, to try and improve passage of a, all anadromous, all migratory fish species in the Cape Fear River. This is a picture of the Rock Arch Rapids fishway at Lock and Dam 1. And similar to Lock and Dam 2 and 3, it has the lock structure on the left-hand side, although you can see the some debris at the, the downstream door, the downstream gate of that structure, which provides some illusion to how well it is working and, and operating at the moment. Uh, from the 1960s through the, the 2000s, those locks were operated to pass striped bass and American shad and other migratory fish species. And they did a fairly decent job of doing that. About 60% of the striped bass that uh, made it to Lock and Dam 1, were able to pass upstream of Lock and Dam 1 using those locks. The goal of the Rock Arch Rapids Fishway was to allow the fish on their own to move over Lock and Dam 1 uh, without any human agency 
And the goal was that at least 80% of the striped bass would pass. Unfortunately, research from North Carolina State University showed that only about 20% of the striped bass that make it to Lock and Dam 1 and that Rock Arch Rapids are actually able to move upstream. So the Rock Arch Rapids is not really moving striped bass above that point. During their spawning migration, they're moving from Wilmington to Lock and Dam 1 and attempting to spawn at that location. Currently, there are efforts to improve the Rock Arch Rapids Fishway at Lock and Dam 1. Construction is occurring at this moment to try and improve passage for striped bass. Uh, even if it works, that only gets striped bass to Lock and Dam 2. Uh, and if they were able to get over Lock and Dam 2, they would still have to surmount the William O. Husk Lock and Dam in order to get to their historical spawning grounds. So, and there is no spawning habitat uh, in between any of these locks and dams or below it. So that is, uh, we've assessed that there's really a very poor outlook for any kind of natural uh, self-sustaining striped bass population on the Cape Fear River due to these impediments. Uh, additionally, you know, recently we had Hurricane Florence in 2018 and the declining water quality associated with that hurricane produced a very large fish kill. The Division of Marine Fisheries counted over 500 adult striped bass that were dead in the fish kills that, that followed that event, which really impacted the stock considerably. We had built up a pretty large uh, hatchery, completely hatchery supported population, but there were large individuals in the 26 to 28 inch size range. And those fish pretty much all disappeared after that event. These are the most recent results from the 2019 uh, sampling year for parentage based tagging. And we see extremely few adult fish, fish larger than that 500 millimeter size class. Um, we do see some unknown origin or no genetic tag fish in the smallest size classes. And, and uh, we're going to be uh, following those fish as they advance uh, in age. But you know, again, over 90% of the, the population of the Cape Fear is, is hatchery origin. And with that, I'll take any questions on the tar noose or Cape Fear River striped bass. And I'll, I'll leave you with this picture of uh, District 2 assistant fish biologist T.D. Van Middlesworth with the biggest striped bass that's been collected from the Noose River in the last 15 years. This was uh, taken in 2020. Um, and this fish was about 30 pounds. And so this was, they claimed this fish after the uh, moratorium was placed on noose and tar river striped bass. You, you really can't say if, if that's the reason that fish uh, was, was actually able to make to the spawning grounds or not. Um, but it was, it was good to see that fish on the spawning grounds uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing. And, and we'd like to see a lot more of a fish that size in all of these river systems. And we think that's the best chance that we will have to see if we can get some self-sustaining populations in those systems. And with that, Dave, I'll take any any questions as they come up. All right, that's great, Kyle. All right, that's uh, great, Kyle. Uh, yeah, I'm getting a little feedback. Yeah, I'm getting a little but feedback. But if you would, just type your you questions would. in the chat. I'll start out just by asking, uh, what, if any, impact do you think uh, water quality um, in all its varied forms in the rivers in that system may be having on the striped bass populations? Yeah, that's a, a great question. You know, um, it, so water quality, you know, it, it's definitely, you know, it, it's declined over time relative to perhaps, you know, several hundred years ago, but it's really improved over the last you know, since the the EPA and, and over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, you yeah, know, we do see, uh, especially in the Noose and Tar Pamlico River estuaries, uh, you know, large algal blooms and, and fish kills with some regularity, um, but we really don't see very many uh, dead striped bass, if, if any, in those events. Um, you know, these fish are able to, to kind of move out of those areas uh, before they happen. And the other thing is that um, striped bass growth rates in the Tar, Noose, and Cape Fear rivers are, 
are very fast. They, they have better growth rates than the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River population. So they're attaining larger sizes more quickly than striped bass elsewhere. And just following kind of bioenergetics theory, if, uh, if there was some, uh, you know, uh, uh, underlying stressor of, of water quality, then we would expect to see those fish uh, growing slower or, or, or not as well as, as striped bass uh, elsewhere. So we, we don't think that water quality is having a, a big impact on the, on the growth and mortality of these fishes. Um, there's some question as to whether reproduction could be impacted, but um, you know, a, a lot of that is theoretical and, and we don't have any good answers. Uh, on the on the practical uh, side of things. All right. Um, another question is: Do you think that the proliferation of introduced blue and flathead catfish in our coastal rivers is having an adverse impact on striped bass restoration efforts, either by predation or competition? I think so, you know, so certainly they're both through you know competition and direct predation of, of juvenile fish um it's difficult to say the the sum total of that impact but um you know uh, in their you know naturally without those introduced catfish um striped bass would be the the one of the only apex predators in these systems and and now they have that competition so they definitely have a, a negative impact uh, on these on the species um you know is it enough to to prevent recovery efforts uh, you know I, I don't know if it's to that extent or not um you know chesapeake bay has one of the largest blue catfish populations on the east coast but it still has a a pretty robust uh, uh striped bass population even though it is um you know it, uh, it's seen better times than than the current moment, but um, that's a, a, a great question. All right, um, that's all I'm seeing in the chat. So anybody got any any additional questions for Kyle? Um, Kyle, I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but getting a lot of good jobs, great presentation, very informative. Um, not seeing any additional questions. I'll just again thank you for doing the presentation. I agree with. The others that it, it 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 has been very informative and I appreciate the combination honestly of the multiple presentations that we've had uh, that have really given a really complete picture of that uh, collection of fisheries efforts down there in the coastal plains of it. Uh, and with that, uh, I appreciate it. Everybody have a great rest of your day.